Well, good morning. Welcome to the Art of Fire Glass Blowing Studio, and we've got some treats for you today. The theme is Toast the Couple, and since the springtime is quite often a season of celebration and usually a lot of weddings and stuff, we're going to emphasize those types of gifts and pieces that you may want to pick up today. So let's go in and see what we've got in store. Let us know when you're here. Say hello. That's that's part of the game, okay? So, uh, we've got a large selection in our gallery. We've got a multitude of colors. We've got vases. We've got bowls. We've got all kinds of beautiful pieces here that would make really great gifts that a happy couple would enjoy. And uh, here are some samples right here. Here's a couple of uh, tulip-shaped goblets and whatnot. We've got all kinds of things in store for you today and as you can see a lot of choices some really elaborate work some fairly simple but elegant pieces most anything you could imagine well good morning everybody good morning jennifer and kathleen and why don't all of you say good morning to foster and theta good morning folks good morning. yeah hey all righty so Let's go on back into the studio area and see what we've got going on. Check out our schedule for the day and let's uh, take a quick look. Good morning, Kristen. And uh, you know, sometimes I miss the comments as they fly by, but I've made a pair of uh, uh, shamrock glasses and I believe they went to Kristen and she wrote a nice comment last week that I didn't see when it happened. So I'm glad you enjoy them. All right, so for today's episode, we're going to be doing a feathered ruffle vase. Todd will be doing that. Then we'll have a champagne glass and we'll have a long stem goblet and then what we call a unity vase. Well, good morning, Patrick and everyone else. Joanna, really good to have you with us. Hope the other folks from the UK come back and join us. Uh, we did a 25-minute uh, presentation earlier on YouTube and we had almost as many people from the UK as we did from the US so that's really cool before we go any further this uh, beautiful little green vase right here was our giveaway from last week and that's from Cher that's for Cheryl Bendman Cheryl is a glass blower out in Colorado so it's our pleasure to send it if you uh, comment you'll be entered in the drawing for this beautiful gold vase here and uh, it's got that, uh, it's kind of an extended hexagonal shape, okay? This was done in the mold that you all saw us use last week, which was the uh, one made from ball bearings. Good morning, David. Good morning, Cheryl. Cheryl, I don't know if you just tuned in or not, but you are the winner, and this is your piece, and it'll be on the way to you. So congratulations, and glad you're able to join us from Colorado. So Cheryl was wondering, she said, oh, I really hope that it's signed. And absolutely, you can see, I don't know if you can make it out on camera, a little hard, but anyway, it's always signed R. Foster, and then AOF for Art of Fire, and we do that for all our pieces, so they're always hand signed by the artist. So absolutely, Cheryl, you're going to be getting a signed piece from Foster. There we go. All right. Very cool. Very cool. All right. So uh, here are some samples. Uh, it looks like uh, we're mostly associating toasting, which is a good thing, uh, along with a wedding celebration or any other type of springtime celebration. So uh, on the front here, we've got some of our stemless wine glasses. You've seen demonstrations of those before. We've also got some uh, goblets back here with about a three inch stem on them. Some of them in a open bowl shape or more tulip like, okay. And back here on the back row are the long stem goblets. So you'll see one of those demonstrated a little later. Uh, we've got the goblets here. And we've also got what we call a unity vase, which is really great for uh, ceremonies of any kind, particularly weddings. And typically what we've done in the past, this one was made by a couple. They selected some frit. So you might pick two contrasting colors of frit and have them in a bag like that. And then at some point during their ceremony, they will combine the frits all into one container. So that's the idea of the unity, a little symbolism there. 
But then what they do is bring the combined frit back into the studio and then we get the vase created. And it could be a bowl or any shape that the couple would like. We can handle all of that sort of thing. And if you'd like to get one from someone for someone, we've got gift certificates available for that sort of thing. You can go online to artoffire.com or call us at 301-253-6642. And of course, we've got a lot of our other pieces on display here. And uh, well, let's go over and talk to Todd and see what's going on. And we'll get started on this. So we're going to have the feathered ruffled vase. Good morning, Todd. All right. We're going to have a feathered ruffled vase. Right. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is a commission for uh, Avalier Health. We've done these before uh, for this demonstration. Uh, it's a corporation that works out of DC as a uh, health advocacy group. Uh, I'm not going into too much detail because I don't understand it. Uh, but what I do know is that they have a, uh, a very uh, creative uh, program, a very generous program where they give out five-year commemorative gifts, and I've been uh, fortunate enough to be part of that, creating those and coordinating with uh, with uh, the folks there in Abilene, Jen Mendelson, uh, drop a name. Uh, sorry, Jen. So we have, uh, we're going to do a mix. It's a custom piece. It's a violet mix, but uh, with a little extra depth of color to it. So we're going to provide uh, a couple of different shades of purple. We're going to throw one more coat of purple on top of that to darken a little bit. Then we've got a band of uh, blue-green mixture of colors that we're going to put across the top. Let's throw all those colors to a hooking tool to pull the feather pattern through that. We'll put another gather of clear glass on top of that whole thing. We'll swing it out and make a nice taper base to it. Josh is off camera right now. It's going to make a foot. You folks have seen uh, the feet before. But he's going to put that uh, together and coat it with a layer of very finely ground purple. We'll drop that on top, make the foot, turn it around, ruffle it, boom, 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 there you go. Okay, sounds great. And while Todd's preparing, we've really got to address the conversation going on in the comments section. And Bridget is asking if anybody here wants to get married. Of course, it was initiated by Joanna, who said she would love the va Unity vase, but she needs someone to marry. So any of you that are in the market, you know, just get right out there. We'll play matchmaker. We're quite happy to do that, you know. Uh, be one of those reality shows. What is that? Switch tables. That's good. <laughs> so Bridget says she does go to Ireland a lot and technically can get English citizenship too, she believes. Wow. There you go. That's that's pretty impressive. Good morning, Barbara. And hello, Lynn. Yep, we we're, we're here. Yep, it's the matchmakers. Matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. <laughs> All right, Todd's taking his first gather of glass. Uh, this is your first visit with us. Uh, the furnace over there holds about 450 pounds of molten glass. It runs all year long. It's held at about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's uh, quite fluid at this point. You can see Todd's controlling it, he's letting it run off the iron a little bit. Now he'll shape it on a metal table called the iron, uh, the marver. And so he's got the iron on the marver. That's what I get for trying to read comments and narrate at the same time. Okay, so he's got the bubble started in the glass, and you can see it's taken on kind of a round shape. And what he'll do now is marver it again, and just make it a little more cylindrical. Okay. Just gotta let that cool off a little bit because uh, if he were to go in and gather right now, the intense heat of the next gather 
Is this any crazier than any other online dating service? No. Oh, I like David Hogan came back with Glassmaker, Glassmaker, make me a glass. <laughs> I'm not going to go for any rhymes with that. We'll just leave it alone right there, folks. And we'll concentrate on Todd's glass working. He's taking another glass, uh, gather there. And this fresh molten glass, he'll bring it over. If he needs to, he can... Uh, uh, block it a little bit. These are the cherry wood blocks. A nice tight grain on the cherry wood. It's always kept in water. The pieces are cut and shaped with it. We're all green wood. Okay. And this puts a little skin on the outside of the glass. Gives it a little bit of stability. Some uniformity. And a lot of symmetry. Which is really important here. We'll block that a little bit. Notice these nice smooth motions, everything's slow, under control, doesn't pay to get frantic in here. You can also see, I hope the focus is enough that you can see the air bubble has narrowed just a little bit. Okay, we know that happens, it's something we're used to in working the glass, but the heat from that gather collapses the bubble just a little bit, and you can see from the wider shape right now that he got a little more air back into it. Good morning, Diana. All right. Another shaping on the Marver. It's but one of the tools we have for shaping glass. We use the jacks. We use the blocks. We use the marvering table. We can even do what's called air marvering. Hello, Michael Herman, and the welcome Art of Fire says, welcome here. Yeah, all right. So now Todd's got the glass shaped a little bit. He's got a little bit of a wide spot right in the middle. This is going to help him with the pickup of the frit. So let's take a real close look at the shape of that gather, or parazon. And you can see it's wide in the middle tapered downward toward the tip and back toward the blowpipe. What that's going to help do is shape the next gather of glass a little bit, so it'll have the same appearance. And then when he comes over to pick up the frit, it'll already be shaped up like he needs it. One of these colors is going to go in the upper part of the vessel. That would be the one cl uh, closest to the edge of the marver. That's going to go near the blowpipe. The other one is going to go down in the lower half, and by having that wide spot in the middle, or a hint at the wide spot, yeah, I'll be glad to talk about air marvering in a moment, okay, Kathleen. What this will do is allow him to control the flow of glass. Now, he's letting it drip off back in the furnace. You can't quite see that, but now you can see the tapers toward the pipe and toward the tip. There's the glass running away. We'll bring it up to level in a moment, and it'll just burn itself right off. Now he's got that nice shape, so let's watch what happens at the Marver. Well, I was wrong. He's going into the bowl of frit first. It's okay. Yes, Renee, there are lots of rhymes. Okay, air marvering, Kathleen, is simply shaping the glass with gravity and the heat. So if we hold the glass nice and level and it's warm, it doesn't elongate and it doesn't uh, compress back toward itself. But if you take that hot glass and you just stand it up in the room and point it down toward the floor, it's going to elongate. And if you take it and point it toward the ceiling, it's going to compress or fall back toward the pipe. So we can make this slug of glass longer or shorter as we wish. So now he's got another color there and this is how he's using that uh, wide spot in the middle to get a, a band down there. And the other uncovered portion of that will get that other line of frit. So that's pretty much what air marvering is, and except for the constant turning involved. Wow, thank you, Yuli, I appreciate that. Because uh, 
Yeah, as David is saying for us, hot glass moves and cold glass don't. But about the only thing we really have trouble air marvering would be the symmetry or the symmetrical portion of the glass with even distribution, uh, getting it nice and round. We can control that to a degree, but uh, yes, Kathleen, basically I never called it air marvering before. I just figured that we'd throw that out there. Thank you for paying attention. I'm teasing. <laughs> Yeah, it's great to have your questions. Please jump right in there uh, and uh, we'll answer any questions we can. If you're interested in seeing uh, our catalog of pieces, go to artofire.com. Very extensive list of uh, glass pieces there. You can see them all. Well, actually, not all of them. We make pieces that uh, sometimes aren't in the catalog. Good morning, Joy. Welcome aboard. Todd's getting his color mixes all together. So this is all part of the decorative process. And quite often, this can take nearly as long as the uh, making of the piece itself. Thank you, Cheryl. Appreciate that. Now you guys are going to give me a big head. But anyway, uh, it, it's nice and it's my pleasure to explain these things. My background, uh, I was uh, a high school band director for a number of years until I left that and went into air traffic control. So concise communication became the key. Boy, is that some pretty cool alliteration. All right, so now we got that last band up toward the pipe. And Todd's got the color mixes going on. So anyway, uh, as far as the, the background part of it, I got had to learn how to explain things pretty quick. Actually, I also found out in teaching that if you can really explain something to a student so that they can understand it, you understand it very well yourself. There's a lot of really outstanding glass blowers, but they sometimes just don't have a put into words exactly what they're doing because it comes naturally to them. And personally, I think I have screwed up just about everything you can in glass blowing. So it's a great way to learn. So now you can see with the angle of the iron and the glass right on the edge of the marver, he's got that glass and now his colors, they'll have a little bit of an overlap toward the middle, but not much. And he's going to feather this or rake it anyway, okay? Uh, Lynn, uh, I actually had to learn to play all of them, and, uh, but trumpet was my major instrument and clarinet was a minor. Okay, so Todd's going to get all this color on here and this is what's going to be the decorative pattern, okay? And then he'll manipulate those colors. Yeah, interacting with you all is really a lot of fun. We did have an episode about a month or so ago where we couldn't see the comments, and it just kind of took the joy out of it. But if you're someone that's uh, come across this episode at a later date, and you're wondering why the heck are they talking to the people, it's because we're doing it live, and that's what we really enjoy. Todd's using the pipe cooler now. You can see a little bit of steam coming up. The pipe cooler is a really interesting tool uh, in our arsenal because what it allows us to do is choke up on the iron, grab closer to the glass, okay? So um, by having the pipe cooled enough, you can get a little bit of leverage there. Yeah, from brass blowing to glass blowing. Thank you, David. That's pretty cool. Okay, so... Uh, Anyway, back to the pipe cooler, yeah, and the leverage. You can, if we have to hold the iron back by the handle, it's harder to control. But when Todd can place his hand up to the midpoint or even beyond the point of balance, okay, that gives him real leverage. So what he's doing now is twisting the glass, okay? 
by turning in one direction the torque or the friction against the marver grabs those little pieces of frit and twists them around. So what were single dots of color, the frit, are now turning into lines. As you turn on the marver in one direction, the friction between the glass and the tabletop stretches those dots out into lines. And he'll do that to the point that he's happy with that. Sometimes uh, you've seen him use the optic mold to do that. Well, how about that? Talk about predicting the future. He's using the optic mold, the fin mold there now, to twist the glass and all of those lines will be even tighter. So we'll take a quick look at that. All right, cool. So now you can see how we've got lines all over it. And that's not just a cool pose on his part, pointing the glass up. It's intentional because it has to do with the length of the glass. Remember just a few minutes ago we talked about air marvering? Well, by pointing the glass upward while he trapped the air in it, he not only had the glass expand, he managed to let it come back toward the blowing iron. So now, a little more marvering and shaping. Yeah, sometimes we get a little bit of squeaking in the, uh, in the optic mold there. He's bringing this back down to a little bit more of a cylindrical shape. So once he gets all this uh, shaped up exactly like he wants, he'll begin the feathering process. So here he goes with his of glove. And he'll use uh, this little tool with a hook on it over here. Will you be raking both directions, Todd? Up and down? Okay. So, he's let the glass cool somewhat because he doesn't want it flopping all over, but now he wants the surface really, really hot. And when he gets the surface hot, he'll pull the piece back. You'll let it see, you'll see the tip hang toward the floor. Then he'll flip it 180 degrees. He'll put the hooking tool over the end of the piece, lightly grab the tip and draw back. And while all that's happening, the piece will fall flat toward the floor. There's the flip, there's the grab, and as he pulls back, the piece continues to fall toward the floor. In for another heat, and he'll do the opposite side. So it's really a, a quite a little coordinated process here. It's uh, the ultimate in rubbing your hand, head and patting your belly. Of course, I've heard people describe glass blowing in general as that. So he'll come out, he'll let it fall, he'll flip it and rake it. There it's down, he flips it. And by pointing the pipe upward at about 45 degrees, he minimizes the fall. And the fall has brought it back in line with the pipe instead of going past it and toward the floor. Had he held that iron perfectly level as the piece fell, it would have gone past the center point and down toward the floor. Now he's got two more to do in this direction. It's up. See the 45 degree angle? He's holding the pipe so the piece doesn't fall too far toward the floor and that allows him to get right back in and go through the same process once more. This particular direction uh, I find easier. I think most of us do because you're pulling back toward the pipe. You're pulling back toward the iron. When he turns it and pulls the, and it goes the other way, that's what a little trickier. So you can see that the manipulation causes a little bit of distortion to the shape. There's a great deal of glass up close to the moil or up close to the pipe. That's why he's marveling at this angle. You can see the glass being pushed off the pipe 
and getting an angle. And now he's going to have it right back where he was before he started pulling on it. And it's always time for coffee. Is that a single malt coffee? <laughs> Alrighty, so now it's time to rake the other direction to go from the iron toward the tip of the piece. And this is a little harder to do. The piece wants to move constantly. So let's see if we can get a good view here. He'll probably rake about halfway along the piece. And then go to the other side and rake again. Look at how the gather of glass, the parazon, is aligning with the pipe. It's never going 90 degrees or perpendicular to the pipe. Yeah, Cheryl, it, uh, it is a good, good thing to be doing it, uh, doing this close to the glory hole so the time is saved and the heat. Now he's going to finish up those first two pulls that went toward the bottom. Notice he grabs right where he left off, and you can probably detect that this is lengthening the glass a little bit. So while we go through this process, we don't want it to get out of control, we don't want it excessively long, and if we need to, we can adjust. Virginia, uh, absolutely, you are uh, welcome aboard. Sorry you're late, and of course you did miss something absolutely amazing. I sang for a little bit. Okay, so now Todd's pulling those down toward the point. But more importantly, Todd is making, in the process of making a beautiful feathered ruffled vase. So he's doing the feathering right now. And the feathering refers to the design element you'll see in the finished piece. So his object here is to, oh yeah, an art of fire dating experience. Yeah, uh, this is like a charity auction where we're going to auction someone off for, for an arranged marriage. Right. Okay, so now he's going to the other side, pulls up about halfway, flips it. Notice the greater motion in the gather of glass this time. Not only does it fall toward the floor, it gets pulled a little bit away from the pipe. So yeah, um, any of you that joined us late, yeah, Virginia, that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, we were talking about the episode being centered around uh, wedding gifts. And so people were talking about getting married and we were just having a good time making light of the fact that we could arrange marriages here, but that's absolutely not true. Concentrate on Josh, I mean Todd, pulling that, okay? And now he's got those four points pulled to the bottom, and he's going to use his diamond shear to clip it a little bit, and then he'll knock that off. And that way there won't be any uh, rough spots down in the bottom. He's going to heat that up, marver it some more, and get it in shape. So, Foster, would you mind seeing if there's a piece either on the back shelf or maybe in the gallery that has the feathering pattern so we could just put it out and uh, show folks what this is going to look like? This feathers, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, sometimes. Uh, just describing it. Uh, other other studios may have a different terminology. They might not describe this the same way we do. So just so you can see a sample of what it is we're doing here, probably a good idea to see one that's been completed. And I'm sure we've got one down in the gallery somewhere. Yeah, Lynn, the, the feathering really is beautiful. That's a, it's a tricky one to learn with the coordination involved. So now what Todd will concentrate on is reshaping this parazon or gather of glass to where... Ah, Steve, sorry you have to leave. Thanks for dropping in with us and uh, hope you catch us on, on the replay. All right, so now he's working on... Josh, Todd is working on twisting it. He's going to twist the rakes. Okay. 
Sometimes we uh, leave them straight, sometimes we can twist them. So let's see what a feathered pattern looks like over here. Here are what the feathers look like when they were run straight, okay? You can see where the glass was raked upward toward the opening of the vessel, downward toward the bottom, and that's feathering. Now, if you can just imagine that then twisted, the feathers will run at about a 45 degree angle across the piece. So that's what Todd's working on right now. Again, the angle of the iron determines what part of the glass is contacting the marver, and that controls the shaping. Well, welcome, Jana. Yep, we're, we're your fine feathered friends. Cheryl, that uh, feathering technique is probably even older than glass blowing. Uh, glass blowing's been around for about 2,000 years. Glass working was done before that. Uh, fortunately, this is no longer a working dairy farm, or I'm afraid Foster would have some of us making core-formed vessels. And the way core-formed vessels were made years ago, animal dung mixed with hay was formed into a solid core and then dipped into a vat of molten glass, just as we gather glass now and then patterns could be made, colors could be added, and a small vessel could be made. And then it fell upon probably one of the junior workers to take the vessel and scrape out the core. Of course, it was the really junior workers that had to assemble the core in the first place. So Todd's grabbing the big block. We're gonna get some more glass here. So if you Google uh, core-formed glass vessels, you'll see some really amazing examples. And I have seen quite a few of them that have a really nice uh, raked or feathered pattern. The, uh, the feathers in the glass is no different than marble and paper. You lay your ink out, you pull through. The only difference is you lay the paper on the surface and pick that up, whereas we put it on the surface and then do that work, but it's analogous to more of a paper. Oh, okay, yeah. So, yep, there was probably feathering before there was even any type of glass working. Oh, Antoinette, it's not gross. At least these days you could wear latex gloves. All right, you can see the glass just running right off the piece. That's very fluid, that viscosity. All right, and he'll start to turn, and then that little trail will just burn itself right off. If he wants to get rid of that little bit on the end, he'll use diamond shears and pull it out a little bit, and then just start cutting it, and that just peels it off. There we go. All right. So now he's got his outer layer done there. Nose plugs as well, Antoinette says. Well, okay. <laughs> yes, Barbara, dong is also burned for heat. I think I'd rather have the smell of peat, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a heat source. All right, so now our decorative elements are done. So here we are a half hour into the piece, and we're just to the point that we've got the decoration done. And that's why the glass blowing take, why does he remove that amount of glass? So that he has left what he needs. I had it explained to me one time that you should think of working with glass as a subtractive art much as someone would say plastering a ceiling. 
or putting up a plaster crown mold, for instance. You take a little bit more than you need and you can take away what you don't need. You can either cut it off toward the end, you can let it drain off just like he did then. After a little bit of marvering and shaping, he's going to blow into the piece and note he's free blowing now. He's not using the trapped air with his finger. And because he marvered the piece, the expansion is up toward the top. I don't know about that, David, but uh, I'll take your word for that as the origin of the phrase. Okay, so now a little more marvering, bringing that center diameter down a little bit. And this angle, notice how the whole lower, oh, what, maybe six or seven inches of the glass we're in contact with the marble, and that's what allows it to cool. Let's walk on over here and watch the inflation, and you'll see that it's inflating toward the top, but not the bottom. That's because of all the marvering. Marvering can thicken the glass as well as cool it. And it's very important in these vessels that we keep an adequate reservoir of thicker glass toward the bottom. We don't want it to get excessively thin toward the top, but we, we don't want really thin glass at the bottom. That causes problematic uh, break-offs when we take them off of the putty. The glass is really thin, it's very weak. Okay, so another application of heat, and it's time for the jack line. That constriction will be the point of separation from the blowing iron. The blades of the jack make that increase. That will blow it out just a little bit more. Good morning, Sharon. Welcome aboard. Now this base is going to be a lot taller than what you see right now. So you have to kind of pre-plan on what you're doing. And we're gonna keep a nice, like I said, thick reservoir of glass down there. But Todd will inflate this at some point to a larger diameter than the finished product. We make most of our vessels by creating a sphere or nearly a sphere with a jack line in it. And then once we've blown it out some, we alter the shape of that sphere through gravity or with uh, centrifugal force. So you're going to really emphasize that neckline. Those of you that are glass blowers, it's really advantageous sometimes to point the iron down like that because then the glass doesn't run away from you and try to wind up perpendicular to the pipe. If the pipe is already pointing 45 degrees toward the ground, then you don't have to worry about it falling to 90. And you can see that he's getting a much more spherical shape here right now. And he's still got plenty of glass down in the bottom. The newspaper cools it. And he's going to take our well-named tool here, the blow hose. Because it's a hose you blow through. Anyway, the coupling joins to the blowing iron at the mouthpiece. He's got the... Uh, plastic bit in his mouth right now, this will allow him to sit at the bench, use the tools, and at the same time blow. So in many uh, practices, people have an assistant blow for them. Well, <coughs> excuse me, due to COVID, of course we can't do that. But even so, it's kind of an advantage to be able to supply the air yourself, do the hand tooling, and not have to worry about telling somebody to stop blowing or start blowing for more air or less. So Todd's totally in control of all aspects at this time. He'll use the newspaper to shape and cool and at the same time blow. You'll detect an increase in the diameter in the midst of that. Now the shaping and cooling right here is going to help him with the swing out, the dropping of the ball. See, this has a lot of similarities to New Year's Eve. Uh, dropping of the ball. Come on, Josh. <laughs> okay, 
So this is a little bit larger diameter in points than what the piece is going to be. And pretty soon he's going to start to lengthen it. So we've got the spherical shape with a jack line in it. A good distribution of glass throughout the bubble size he knows because he looks at the outside of the vessel. You'll also see that he's heating primarily from the widest point down. You can see some of the glass is outside the glory hole. That's to keep it stable up near the top where the jack line is. The lengthening will occur lower down. And that's because... Come on, David Hogan, fill in the blank. Okay, hot glass moves and cold glass don't. So now he's getting a little longer shape to it. Uh, Todd has a, uh, a blue mixture and a, uh, a green mixture, right? It's a blue green mix on top. Blue green. The other man here. Everything below is a purple pink cranberry. Okay, and it's raked throughout. The feathered effect was also twisted. So he controls the heat distribution by how deep in the glory hole he's got the piece. And we can see that he's got the neckline just about outside the doors. Now, there is plenty of reflected heat. That glory hole runs in excess of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So all of it's going to get hot. But when he brings it out, take a look at what part is orange. That's where the heat's located. And that's what's going to move. A little bit of spinning the iron, centrifugal force will elongate it. And this was why in that region he needed a slightly larger diameter than the finished product. The newspaper will help him straighten that out. Oh, David Hogan has a uh, acronym for hot glass moves, cold glass don't. So all we got to do now is go with the HGM CGD. I think we should get that on the next uh, set of Art of Fire t-shirts. <laughs> oh, Bridget, we can do as many rakings as we want. Yeah, we could do... Uh, we could do five. If you watched a couple weeks ago, Josh did a piece where there were six. In fact, we had an elementary school class work, uh, watching, and we challenged them with a math problem and asked them to figure out how many degrees between each of the six lines would be required to get the six evenly spaced pieces. And the kids came up with the answer. Okay. Uh, we can do the rakes in one direction only. We can do them bi-directional. It's uh, your choice. Okay, so there's a little bit of a indentation. It's just a little bit. Uh, the Todd's got his blow hose back, and he's going to use the blow hose to inflate, and he's going to use the paper to straighten. So you can see right now the reflection of the fluorescent light in the side of the piece, and you see a nice straight line. And that's a really cool thing, because when you've got straight-sided vessels, the light reflects as a straight line. If you don't have straight sides, it looks kind of wobbly. So that's really pretty cool. So uh, now the guys are going to work on the foot, and it's going to have a color foot. As Todd said earlier, this is a, uh, a custom order. So Josh has got a good bit of glass here for the foot. He's going to collect the frit on the end of that. And then he'll go melt that in. So while he's melting that in, Todd's double checking his shape, his symmetry, and keeping plenty of heat in the piece. 
He's got the sofietta here. He's going to cool the bottom a little bit before they add the foot. And he'll also be able to use that sofietta then when they do the transfer if he needs to cool the punty. They're talking back and forth. Josh is letting him know that uh, he's getting another gather of the uh, violet color to the foot. <coughs> so the communication is really key here. We gotta have a good handle on who's doing what and how much longer it's going to be. Todd's got his shears. He's gonna be ready to receive the piece. He'll take his final flag. Josh is over here and he's going to cut a jack line to help it separate from the pipe and then he'll present it to Todd after a quick reheat. Thanks for stopping in Barbara, glad you were here. Here comes Josh with the glass. Glass goes on to the body, Todd will clip that off. Take a quick reheat. So he's getting the uh, small map gas torch from Foster. Foster will place that on the bench for him. Now what he'll do is even out that uh, ball of glass that is the foot, get it symmetrical, get it evenly distributed around the central axis of the piece, and begin to flatten it so that it'll sit evenly on a tabletop. He's using the torch right now to heat the area of the neck. Rather than put everything back into the glory hole right away and heat it all, he can preheat the neck. And now when he goes back in, Josh wants me to back up so he can cool the putty iron. Oh, you don't care if I back up or not, right? I can get burnt. Right. <laughs> All right, so Josh will shape the putty. And at the same time, Todd is shaping and reheating. He'll take his paper and use his thumb to create an indentation in the center of the foot be able to put the putty in there. Now when he pushed on that with his thumb, it moved the glass a little bit. Again with the cooling, just to make sure it's not too hot. So take the putty from Josh, place it in the center of the foot, and now from the bench, Todd will turn both irons. And right now with the Sofietta, what he's doing is cooling the putty a little bit heating the neck with the torque. You notice how far Josh's hand is up toward the piece? That's because he cooled the pipe that he was able to do that. Okay? If he hadn't, he wouldn't be able to hold it there. And because of the weight of this piece, he wants some leverage. Tap of the pipe and off it comes. And it's still moving a little bit, but that's what we want. Todd takes over from Josh, and now it's time to heat the upper reaches of the vessel. So in most of the pieces we make, we form anywhere from half to two-thirds of the lowest part of the vessel first. We do a transfer to a punty, and then we finish the piece off at the top of the piece. So right now, Todd is having to reheat the top of the vessel. It was cold enough to fracture, it's going to take a little while to reheat and become malleable again. He'll concentrate the heat there and every once in a while you'll see him flash the whole piece. That's in order to keep the piece from getting below a thousand degrees Fahrenheit, which would cause cracking. So when he comes back to the bench, he'll use his jacks. He'll work on the lip, and he may have Josh paddle the lip flat while he does that. All depends on how it broke off. So, 
Actually, he's going to use the paper first. That's to straighten and support and center the vessel. He's getting it perfectly aligned. And then he can go back and get a little more heat and work things out on the top. <coughs> if you notice a little bit of asymmetry somewhere, it's a good idea to go ahead and straighten it out. You don't always have to do it. Uh, true master glass blowers know exactly how much they can get away with. But uh, for the most part, when you see something's off, you probably ought to address it. And he did just that. So now it's time to get it hot on the lip and come back to work the lip. Be sure to comment, like, and share. Comments will get you entered in the drawing for next week's free piece. And uh, Cheryl was the winner of last week's piece. We'll go over and show those in a few minutes. And if you like and share, particularly the sharing, that helps us increase viewership. And that's something that's... Uh, really good in the Facebook world. All right, so Todd's concentrating the heat on the lip of the vessel to come back and begin to work that. Seems like everybody's <coughs> quiet today. Oh, we're getting, we're getting uh, once, once we got out of the marriage ceremony and tried to play matchmaker, <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. I don't know, maybe they're off on a private chat room trying to work <laughs> something out there. I don't know. All right, now he's got the jacks into the opening. Josh shields his arm with one paddle and flattens the lip with the other. <coughs> so this uh, vase is going to be ruffled so the heat will get concentrated up in that top portion. <coughs> He'll turn it. <coughs> Excuse me. So sorry. Uh oh. <coughs> I think it's pollen. Is that what, it, is that what we're saying? <laughs> yeah, it is. <coughs> By increasing the rotational speed, that upper area will flare out. You'll get it to spin out almost like a top hat. Then as it's turning, angle it down. Turning very slowly. And there's the ruffles in it. Beautiful. Okay, now Josh is ready to catch it with a pair of gloves. Todd's going to put a little bit of water at the punty joint. He'll tap the pipe. Off it goes into the annealer. Thank you, Todd. That's amazing. Beautiful piece. Let's hear it for Todd, folks. Really, really nice. And you'll be able to see the feathering effect to a lot greater degree tomorrow when we post the pictures. Uh, somebody noted that it was transparent, and it is, so it's a little harder to see with the heat on. Okay, Jennifer Kaslev is in my corner. She says there is a lot more pollen in the air today. <laughs> Oop, the comment disappeared. Something about cicadas. Oh my God, you think I inhaled a cicada? Oh. Oh. <laughs> okay, so let's see what's going on here. Um, we've seen the feathered ruffle vase. Foster's going to be making a champagne glass for us. Unfortunately, he's not going to fill it for us to enjoy lunch, but uh, hey, take what you can get. All righty, and again, here are samples of the toasting pieces that you might take from us oh yeah let's uh this is uh cheryl's piece uh from last week and she was curious if it was signed and it is and the giveaway for next week is this beautiful little gold vase with the fluted lip so make your comments get them in there and you can be in the drawing for it so we've got a wide variety of drinking vessels here 
And so let's go to the man and find out what color you're going to use. We're going to do cobalt blue. All right, cool. There you go. So is this going to be one of your traditional champagnes? Yes. Okay. So the traditional champagnes are this shape over here that you seal with this kind of teal color there. And what's really unique about these is the stem is actually pulled from the body of the vessel instead of being an uh, add-on. So that's a really cool thing to see. Okay. So Foster's got his iron warming up. And he's got the piece of blue already in the annealer. It had to warm up also. He put that in there about, oh, five or ten minutes ago. Attaches the piece of blue to the iron, and he'll make his way over to the glory hole. As he comes by, we'll get a good look at it, and you can see that it does still look like a chunk of glass. It doesn't look like melted glass, because 900 degrees is not enough to melt it. But I can guarantee you that glory hole is <clears throat> That'll take care of melting it. So you saw the piece just completed a few minutes ago. And uh, Todd did the color ad addition to clear glass that was already on the iron. He took a couple of gathers, then began rolling through the frit. We have other options for putting color in pieces. We can start with a chunk of color, which is Foster, what Foster's doing here. And then on top of that, he'll be adding clear glass in layers. When he gets done though, the whole cup will look as if it's one solid color. Uh, there we go. He's gonna come over and marver that into shape and put a bubble in it. By blowing, and putting his finger over the mouthpiece. The air is trapped inside. It's got nowhere to go but out into the hot glass. Notice it became more rounded. That was the air bubble pushing the glass. So even though you can't see the bubble, we know it's in there. Okay, now he's gonna let that cool off just a few moments and then go take his first gather of glass from the furnace. How hot can the annealer get? Well, by mistake, we've had it up to about 1,500. We normally run it at about nine. I'm not sure that there's a max on it, but we'll ask Foster when he comes back by. What's the highest you think our annealer would get to, Foster? Uh, these annealing ovens can not get up close to 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, okay. So glass has all kinds of temperatures associated with it. There's an annealing point, there's a slumping point, there's a melting point, there's a fusing point. I don't, I don't even have any idea what all of them are, but at various temperatures you can get the glass to do different things. So the annealing temperature uh, for this glass is somewhere between about uh, 700 and 850 degrees. Uh, if you take this glass, like the vase that uh, Todd just put away, if we took that up to about 1300 degrees it would start to slump it would start to puddle. Now once again he'll blow, trap the air in the iron, and we'll see that color core get larger. The air bubble is inflating inside the blue, and there we go. Uh, Bridget, not normally would we want the annealer to get uh, that hot, but if we did choose to slump the glass, we could uh, dedicate an annealer to doing that. But uh, we've got a other, couple other options, especially with our electric annealers that are probably better for that. The only time we get up over a thousand degrees is when 
we've left uh, the fuel and the air mixture too high and forgot about it. Normally we hold it right about 900 or 910. Foster's taking his second gather of glass. And this is the one that will go into the optic mold. So by controlling the amount of glass gathered, he'll have just what he needs to get in the optic mold. And the block in this case can also be used to kind of elongate the glass. Now he's going right into optic mold. He's going to get the ridges into that. Blow, tap, and let it expand. When he comes out, he's got the lines in it. There we go. So now, whether you're a glass blower or not, this next part will be really pretty interesting. He's going to begin the process that leads to pulling the stem from the body of the vessel. So he'll take his jacks, and the first thing is to establish a bit of a neckline or jack line. Now watch as he draws the, iron, the tool down, and he pulls out a little bit. See as his hand moves away from the piece? It elongates it, and because of the angle, it tapers it. Now, with a little button cut right onto the end, that's eventually where it will go with the foot. By pulling out gently now and not squeezing hard, he can manage to lengthen that. Here he goes with more air into the cup, what will be the cup of the vessel, and then it's back to the heat. So he's using that little knob on the end to pull against. He puts the jack blades against it, but he doesn't squeeze. If he squeezed really hard at that point, he would cut another jack line and that little ball would separate from the piece. Now he's going to elongate it by spinning it around. A little bit of air just to increase the volume. And now with the jacks, watch Okay, first the jack line, but now watch the action down toward the bottom of the vessel. He's pulling, but he's not squeezing. He's trying to keep a consistent diameter on that stem. He'll check it with the calipers to see if he's got the length that he wants on it. I think he knew that he didn't without measuring, so he's going to go back and he's going to get this just a little bit longer. Foster quite often uses blades on the jacks that are more rounded, and that's what he was using. Ramiro has, uh, said something about Foster was using different jacks. Well, in between pieces, we'll talk about that just a little bit. Now, once he gets this pulled out to the length he wants, check with the calipers, see where he is, and when he knows he's got a little off yet, okay. really important to be able to make the pieces to measure, especially if you're hoping to give them as a pair. So if you want to give a pair of uh, champagne flutes to someone, whether there's a wedding upcoming or not, really like them to be pretty close to the same size. There he is with the paper pegs again. That's the signal to Josh that he's setting the stem and he's ready to put the foot on. So by stabilizing the glass, He'll hand that off. Heck, I'm not sure exactly what shape he's got there, Ted. They're not typical cup jacks, but uh, we'll, we'll show the tools here in a couple minutes. All right, so Josh is flashing the piece. Foster is gathering glass for the foot. This is what's known as a pressed foot or a spun foot. And the way that's created is a glob of glass is put on the end of the piece and then shaped with what are called footboards. Josh will bring the piece over in front of Foster, point it toward the ceiling so the stem is up. Foster cuts a jack line to help the glass flow from the pipe. He'll put it right onto that ball and then clip it off. 
Josh will present it in front of him. Foster will grab his foot for it. He'll press the piece against the stem and then between the boards and he'll pinch it. And as it pinches, it gets a much narrower diameter. Uh, Sharon, we could probably arrange to have somebody's name on a wedding gift. Uh, you'd have to check with the studio, give us a call or email, but yeah, we've, we've done stuff like that before. Sometimes we can actually draw on it with a piece of cane, so it's in color, and it is possible to get it uh, uh, engraved on it, but that's a little trickier. Foster right now is using a tool to shape the foot and flatten it. And then he'll hand this off to Josh once more for another flash. Now it's time for the transfer. And as you can see, the flute is almost complete. Only the top needs to be released from the blowing iron and then opened up so that you can pour some bubbly in it. All right, Foster gets his gather for the punty. He'll come back over here to the marver and shape the putty. It's just a little bit of glass that sticks off the end of the iron. We don't want a lot. If it was really long, it'd be like having a little finger of glass wiggling around. Now he'll use his file to support the front edge of the pipe. He'll put it into the center of the foot, and then by turning both irons and pressing down on his punty if needed, he gets it aligned in the center, scores a mark, taps it, and off it comes. Another beautiful transfer. All right, so at this point, we've got the lip of the vessel, which was cold enough to fracture, so it's got to be reheated to the point that we can work with it. And that's what Foster's doing right now. Now, every once in a while, he'll put the whole piece into the glory hole, the flash heat. The flash heat is just a momentary exposure. Just get it in there for a few seconds. Now, it was a little off center, so he's actually using the yoke to recenter it. So any of you glass blowers out there, you saw that little trick there. The ball bearings in that yoke are hot. They will not cool and crack the glass. Yes, this is a champagne, Patricia. So what he did was he brought the piece back out and laid the stem in between the ball bearings and pressed on the iron until the piece was recentered. You can see where the heat's located from the bright glow. What Foster will do first is open things up just a little bit so he can get his shears into it. That end is a little bit thick for him, so he's going to start turning and cutting, and he's actually just feeding the glass into the shears. And as long as he does that before it gets cold, he cuts through it just fine. So the hot glass not only moves, it can be cut. All right, so now it'll be back over to the glory hole and a little more heating of the upper portions. And now we're gonna to get to see him use the steam cone next. So when we've transferred like this and we've got this large opening on the top of the vessel, it'd be almost like blowing into a Coke bottle if you tried to blow into it and you certainly couldn't inflate it. But if he needs to enlarge, get that up a little bit larger, he can put a wooden cone that's wet into the hot glass and the steam that results will inflate the vessel. So he'll use the back of a pair of jacks to chill the lip so it doesn't get folded and then he'll put the steam cone in and the steam cone will cause the next several inches to blow up. There we go. Okay. And that's how the steam cone works. So once again, it's just the heat, the water evaporating, the combination causes inflation.
Of course, that's a different type of inflation than the Federal Reserve Board is worried about right now. But that's a story for another time. Foster's got the heat out in the outer few inches. He's going to open the vessel a little bit, get a nice side to it, and then he'll put his jacks probably on the outside just to get a nice straight side. And there we go. All right. I don't know, David. I'm so excited. He made a comment about the Pointer Sisters. <laughs> All right. Got a little more work to do on it. He just wants to get this absolutely perfect. And there we go. All right. Ready to take it off. Once again, a slight tip with a butter knife. Oh, he's going to use water on this one. Okay. So we'll put a little drip of water right where the punty joins the foot. You've got to be really careful on that move so that you don't wind up getting the uh, water on the foot. Kristen says her anniversary is next month. She thinks she needs a new set of toasting flutes. Great idea. Beautiful idea. Let us know. Uh, you can place an order. So Foster's going to select. He didn't, he didn't get panicked or anything when that didn't work out. He just comes out back and does it again. But notice he did go over some, for some heat. So now a little bit of water right down there. And then the tap of the iron. The putty comes loose. On go the insulated gloves. There we go. Beautiful. A beautiful champagne glass. Let's hear it for Foster. Come on, folks. Yeah, there you go. Some thumbs up, some hearts. It's beautiful. Yep. Okay. Into the annealer it goes. And uh, let's... Uh, it's like everybody else has run off for a few minutes. So... Foster, can we take just a moment to answer a couple of questions people had? Sure. Okay. Oh, absolutely. If you would grab, if you would grab the jacks you were using there, I'm going to go and grab a pair of jacks okay. off of this bench because somebody specifically asked about what Josh and Todd were using, and actually, Foster has a pair of these also, but these are what we call standard jacks. You can see the blade is a little wider on the back side and tapers toward more of a sharp edge on the front. There's a little bit of curvature at the end. This is the blade that Foster was using. You come around here. It's not exactly round. Are those the ones that were the tines from a pitchfork? Uh, no, sir. No, you have no. another one that's those. Yeah, okay. That's correct. Yeah. But you can see this is a lot more rounded and doesn't have as much of a sharp edge on it. So it's going to do a lot less cutting when you squeeze the jacks. And if you're pulling a stem, it works a lot better because if you inadvertently squeeze, you're not as likely to cut the glass as much. And you have another pair of jacks here that you use sometimes, Foster. Yeah, Let's these, show those off. Uh, we'll use these in this next piece, the long stem goblet. Uh, they're a smaller um, metal blade so that they do not take as much heat from the glass mm -hmm. as a larger body, as a larger blade would. So the amount of steel, when it comes into contact with the glass, can ultimately uh, affect how much glass is, or excuse me, how much heat or viscosity is being taken from the, gla uh, okay. from the glass. Yeah, yeah, okay. So Foster's got. Let's uh, let's take a look at your paper pegs. I keep talking about those. Those are cardboard tubes, really. Cardboard They're, tubes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. They're hollow yep. on the inside. Mm -hmm. And uh, we put those on. Use some hot glass. And so there's uh, yep. There's a this is unused the, cardboard tube. And they're 
with hot glass, we go ahead and put a carbonized layer on the surface of the uh, cardboard tube and soak them in water for a bit so that they hold moisture. When it comes into contact with the glass, it steals a bit of heat, but not as much as with the steel blades. Okay. All right. Thank you. And uh, if Ramiro and uh, I believe Ted are still out there, if that answers your questions about the jacks, uh, good. And if not, we'll try to get more specific. But the, the variety and the shape of the blades and the amount of mass, the metal that's getting in contact, really affects the glass flowing. So there was our champagne glass. Foster's now going to do a long stem goblet, okay? And here's a pair of them right back here. You can see that that's a lot longer stem. Now in this case, the stem is added to the piece. It's not pulled from the body, okay? So that's a really long stem on there with a foot, and that requires a few more. Romero has a question about glory holes for me and Josh. Okay, fire away. We'll uh, keep on. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, yeah. Okay, so uh, it will be the long stem goblet. Foster will be doing that. And while we're waiting for Romero to post his question, congratulations to Cheryl on being the new owner of this beautiful little vase. For your comments, you'll be entered in the drawing next week for this beautiful fluted lip gold vase. Okay. Remember, Romero, keep it PG. <laughs> okay. So, uh, what color have we got this time, sir? This is violet. Violet, okay. Violet color. Oh, are you going to make a mate for the one that you made on the YouTube video an hour and a half ago? That's the Great. Eternity. Okay. Beautiful. So, we're heating the bit of color. And no, that's not a handlebar mustache. That's the calipers in Foster's mouth. There's his own mustache right there. Okay, so he needed the calipers because he set that uh, di uh, length, that dimension, when he made the piece earlier. So we do a YouTube video a half hour before we start the FaceTime. And Foster made a long stem goblet then. Okay, so, and we can actually uh, hang a piece up like this as long as the glass isn't too hot. It won't run toward the floor. So by marvering it and everything, he got that to where it's stable. He can hang it up, go take care of other business at the bench. There he is, checking his calipers. Okay. So once he gets all the measurements ready and knows exactly what he wants to do, he'll be back to take his next gather. And the glass is cooled off sufficiently that he'll take that gather right now. Uh, Ted, I'm sure he'd love to talk to you about that kiln. Uh, just get in touch with him, email, call sometime. All right, taking his first gather from the 450 pound furnace. Well, the furnace itself weighs probably almost a ton but the glass in it's about 450 pounds. Here he comes with the first gather of glass. And he's gonna reheat that a little bit. Because the piece was hanging for a little while, the core was a little bit colder. So he wants to make sure the temperature is even throughout. So here's a little departure from his normal process, and it's simply because he left the piece hanging for a little while. Once he gets this heat evenly distributed, He'll pick up with his normal process, which will be to take it to the bench and use one of the cherry wood blocks. The blocks come in a variety of sizes because sometimes you got more glass than others. So he gets the pipe turning, catches it in the cherry wood cup that chills and puts a skin on the outside, kind of helps stabilize, and it also gives him a nice symmetrical shape. Now, he lets that cool just a little more, and now, blow in the blowpipe, trap the pressurized air column, and here we go, with a bubble of violet coming out.
I'm not sure, Joanna. Maybe I'll ask uh, Josh or Foster. Ted was asking about a vitrograph kiln. Oh, okay, Ted answered, it's a specialized kiln that lets you pull glass from the bottom. So think of a pot with a hole in the bottom and a cover over the hole, okay? And then you put hot glass in the pot and then you open the hole and let the glass stream out and then cut it off, close it up, close the hole, or sit there and panic while all your glass drains out on the floor. That's an oversimplification, but that's the idea. Yeah, I mean, that's it. It's just a part that's of it? the hole in the bottom. A hole in the bottom. You pull stringers out of it. Okay. So he didn't have, he didn't take this one to reheat because he maintained the heat in the piece when he came back. So now he's got a slightly larger block into the optic mold. There's still plenty of heat. He'll blow real hard, trap the air. When he comes out, we'll see the ridges. And there we are, off to the glory hole for more heat. Now this won't be like the last one. He's not going to pull the stem from the body. He's still going to make a jack line, a neckline near the pipe, a point of separation for later. But then what he'll begin to do is to inflate the glass. So this will be more of a bowl shape, okay? You get a little bit of inflating in there. Now more heat and it'll do some more. Was it Pizer that did the bowl? With the what's his first name? Mark. Mark. Pies. Yes, Mark Pies. Okay, so if any of you are still hung up on the vitrograph or want to see something done, let's watch Foster here as he inflates this. He'll use the newspaper to chill the bottom. Then he'll hold it up horizontal and blow. By holding the iron horizontal, you maintain the spherical shape. If he were to point it down, it would get longer. If he pointed it up, it would get shorter. So he's got a nice spherical shape there. He's going to check the diameter to see if this is the right size for the cup. And if it is, we'll be moving on. He marks the bottom with chalk and hands the piece off to Josh. Josh will keep an eye on what Foster's doing and time the flashing of the piece with what he sees down at the other end of the studio. The flashes are only for a few seconds. Foster will gather twice. And he's getting the glass that will form the stem. So he wants a little more substantial amount. Once he gets that gathered, Josh will take a final flash and meet him at the bench. Foster will be cutting a bit of a jack line in the end of that near the pipe so that it flows easily from the iron. Josh holds the piece pointed toward the ceiling. That's the bottom of the cup facing up. Foster will drop the glass on and cut it free. After it's cut free, Josh presents it to him, and Foster begins a manipulation. He'll take the jacks and use the hinge or the strap of the jacks to shape it a little bit and also to put an angle on it. Now by holding the jacks at an angle, he puts more of a slope to it, and he can separate it from the piece a little bit. Josh, Josh is going to get him a uh, moil wrap. So Foster right now is pulling the stem out part way, but you can tell just by looking at that that it's not near long enough. And this process is going to take a few moments, so now what Josh will do is bring him back a gather of glass, and they'll wrap the moil, the moil being the portion of the glass that remains on the pipe after the piece is extracted. It's all up there. But if a crack should start up in that area, it can actually run down into the vessel. 
so that's why we sometimes use a moil wrap. So Foster's getting most of the way there, but he's got a little further to go with it. He's going to take a flash, warm things up, and pull the stem out a little more. So as he mentioned earlier when he held up those jacks to show you all, the thickness of those blades steals a lot less heat than the normal blades, and the more rounded surface doesn't cut as sharp of a line into it. So he's really using the jacks to pull against that ball that's at the end of the stem. He chills a portion so it doesn't pull. Now, not squeezing hardly at all, he pulls out and away from the piece. He'll check his measurement for the length of the stem. If he needs a little more and there's some residual heat, He'll keep going with it, and then he'll check the calipers again. He'll use those paper pegs as he described earlier. They chill, but not a great deal. They straighten the glass. And now it's time for the foot. So a handoff for flashing. That'll be Josh's job. Foster will again take two gathers, so during this process, Josh will probably flash the piece three times very quickly, maybe four. The key is to not stay in there a real long time. If he stays in the flash heat a real long time, he could distort the line of the stem. So Foster now has got the glass, he'll be coming back. They'll meet once more over by the bench. Josh points it toward the ceiling. Foster cuts his jack line over here. And now the glass comes up onto that ball, clipped off. And then he's down to start with the footboards. So he'll paddle that flat a little first. Then he'll open the boards apart and squeeze them together. The one board has notches in it, and the glass stem fits in that. And the harder he squeezes, the thinner and more sharp the edge of that foot becomes. Once he gets that squeezed out, he'll take another flash heat. And he's got the shape of the foot, or the size of the foot set now. It's just a matter of getting its taper and also getting the bottom flat. So he's a nice, really special little hand tool for this. Piece of carbide on a handle. He can use the curved edge there to put a nice taper in it. See how that's a beautiful slope in the top of that foot. Then once he gets that stabilized where he wants, he can use the other edge of it to simply make sure that the bottom is flat. Hand it off to Josh again, and now it's time for a transfer. So just as we said 5,000 times before, we make a half to two-thirds of the piece before the transfer, the lower half of the vessel, in this case probably three-quarters of it, then we transfer and finish it off. So now Foster will take a putty, and he'll just have a little bit of glass off the edge of the iron, just enough to form like a bit of glue, if you will, to the foot. He balances the iron on his file. He dipped the file in water, so it'll be a little bit wet when he scores the neck. So now he's going to turn the assembled irons, all of it's turning. When he has it centered, he scores the neck with the file, taps the iron gently, and off it comes. Beautiful transfer. Okay, that's usually the uh, breath holding moment for glass blowers, and uh, so well done. Now, because that neck was cold enough to fracture and also it had some water on it, it's going to take a little while to reheat and get it to the point that he can work with it again. Now, some of you saw this on the other piece. He just quickly used the yoke to reset the centering of the piece. So centering is simply an equal distribution of the material around the central axis. 
Okay, so if the punty is placed a little off center in the foot, when you turn at the bench, it bobs up and down. It rotates almost like a camshaft sometimes. And we, we don't want that. We want something that turns smoothly and is symmetrical. So that's what those adjustments were for, was to reattain the symmetry. And as I love to say, it's not what you can make, it's what you can fix. If we had to start over every time we made a mistake, we'd have a lot of wasted glass. He shears through that lip, gets a little of that thick glass off, and then he'll take that back for a reheat and continue to open the upper portion of the vessel. It is a beautiful color, I got to agree with all of you on that. Alright, a flash heat back there, and then he'll pull back out some and heat the cup. So the bulk of the heat is going to be in the cup, the bowl of the goblet, because that's where he's working. And as David Hogan would say, HGM, CGD. Hot glass moves, cold glass don't. I gotta at least get a business card with that on it. All right, so you can see from that orange glow, where the heat's located. Foster's chilling the lip with the back of the jack handle. And now he'll use the steam cone. You'll see the inflation in the bowl, the body there. And when he gets that done, he'll open it up a little bit just to make a place to be able to grab hold of after the next reheat. So, and then it's back to the glory hole for heat. So he's got, what, maybe a minute or so here to work on it? You can see how the bowl of the cup was all that was getting the bulk of the heat. And now it's back to the bench. going to check the diameter compared to the mate that he made an hour and a half ago. He'll check his height. And there we go. Beautiful. Beautiful work. Absolutely. Okay, so once he's done with it, another quick flash, then it'll be time to take that off. So once again, well this time he's going to use the butter knife, tap around the punty joint, then a little tap of the iron will break it free. The gloved hand of the master. And away it goes. All right, let's hear it for Foster, folks. An amazing long stem goblet. Absolutely beautiful. And there's another one in there already that was made earlier today. And so there's a pair right there. If you'd like to have any of the goblets, uh, give us a shout. 301-253-6642 uh, or go to artofire.com. Get in touch with us, and they can be yours. Marvelous job. Thank you, Foster. Thank you, folks. Uh, good to have you with us today. Good.
Could we show one thing real quick I neglected while you were in process? What's that? Okay, so we got some glass blowers watching us, and what I'd like to do is show them one of the things that people quite often get in trouble with, beginners especially when they're blowing glass. So Foster had a really elegant way of getting back into the bench and not shocking the piece. So we're going to pretend that he has the piece on the punty. Here, you can use this one. Okay, yeah. So, lots of times people accidentally smack the iron. So what I'm going to ask Foster to do is imitate his return to the bench with a piece on the putty. Now you notice that he kind of hangs it down and he lays it on the one rail gently and lets it rest there. And look what happens. Over here at the back end, he just lays it simply down. Would you show him what it looks like when you smack that back end? Yeah. If you do that, and there's a piece on the punny up here, it's coming off. So that was what was particularly graceful, and I would have pointed it out, except he was done with the piece when I first noticed it. So by sliding the iron on the bench rail and placing it gently after he gets seated, so if some of you are losing pieces when you're getting seated, that might be the reason. <laughs> okay, so now we have covered the feathered ruffle vase, the champagne glass and a long stem goblet. It's time for a unity vase. And Josh will be doing this, so you want to give us the lowdown on this, sir? Yeah, so a unity vase is there's a couple ways you can go about it. You know, it could be for a wedding ceremony. We've done many of those. It can just be a couple that maybe is renewing their vows. But it's a kind of a symbolic way of taking two colors or two people and joining them and making one person or one couple. So come on back. The first thing we do is we have the couples or the friends or whoever it is pick out their colors. And just as a, for example, I wow. ended up... Wow, so many choices. Yeah, lots of different choices. I ended up picking a nice jade green color and a nice kind of purplish color. Okay, very cool. So they're going to be our two colors that we're going to, for our unity vase. Okay. So the couples usually come in, they'll usually pick out their colors. We usually give them to them in a little bag and that's about plenty of color for what they need. Okay. Then they usually, I have a pretend ceremony over here. Oh, well, I was going to uh, ask. Okay, so. Uh, uh, do we? Do we? Yeah. Do we have to hold hands while yeah, we, we do this? Yeah, we have to hold hands. Who's going to preside preside over our ceremony, Bruce? <laughs> Foster. <laughs> Let's go get him. What the heck? Let's go. Let's go full full bore on this. Hey Foster, we need an ordained glass blower. Come on back here. All right, we are gathered here. <laughs> I don't know, I guess I have to reverse the camera. Oh yeah, okay, you guys do it. We are gathered here today to join in hellacious glass blowing. This couple. All right, let's go ahead with the ceremony. Yeah, okay, shake it in there, yeah. Oh, come on, mix it up, mix it up. Come on, you guys are gonna be together for life. Joined at the hip, okay. All righty, let's swirl it around a little bit. Yeah, okay. So okay. usually there's a ceremony, and this is part of their, you know, the joining of the two people. Okay, very good. They okay, actually, so they, here's the mixed frit. Yep, they bring the mixed frit back to us. And the cool thing is, if they'd like, they can actually have a part in making it. So they can actually watch it being made. They can tell us what kind of shape they want to make. If they like, they can actually do some of the work. They can open the mouth, do a little bit of the swinging, 
but you know, just have the hand in making the vase. Okay. So we're just going to make a little vase to kind of show you an example of what can be done with it. Alrighty. So there you go, Bridget. In case you find that uh, missing marriage partner, we can conduct the ceremony right here. <laughs> the Art of Fire. Get uh, Steve from Yorkshire back online. <laughs> okay. Josh has gathered up the first gather of glass. He's using a block. Notice how the glass is still moving around a little bit. It's still very hot. But by using the block, he's able to put a little skin on the outside, stabilize it some. And the glass is still wobbling. He traps the air, and here comes the bubble. Right out into the midst of it, we fill about two-thirds or so of the volume with air. Maybe one of us should get licensed. Yeah, we start doing ceremonies in the studio. Yeah. One of the uh, controllers I used to work with went out and got a license so he could conduct weddings on the weekend. Now that would be a full service glass studio. <laughs> All right, now Josh is going to pick up the mixed trip. The symbol of the unification of the purple and the green. I don't know what country that would be. And you can see it really doesn't take much color to cover the base. And generally people usually have leftover color and they'll use that for many years to make ornaments. We've had one couple. You can make couple, multiple pieces. Yeah, you can make multiple pieces. We had one couple make a unity box, and then they came in for the holidays and they made a couple ornaments. Great. Yeah, this would be the perfect sunset photo spot. Uh, it's a beautiful setting here. And we hope to have any of you that can make it over here. All right, so now Josh is going to turn the glass and he's stretching it. So you can see where those dots are now turning into lines. The friction against the metal tabletop twists it into lines. But look, there's not much twisting down at the end, down at the tip. That's the point where the friction is. The rest of the glass is free to move from the torque. So, uh, yeah, I could be the wedding singer. Yes, all right. All right, so now he's going to use his shears to grip the end of the piece. He's not cutting it yet. Oh, he did. But he gripped just enough that he was able to get the twist in the bottom. If they come in on Tuesdays at 11, we can even live stream it. Yeah, there you go. We can have a live wedding ceremony. Foster, you got to get licensed to conduct <laughs> weddings. <laughs> okay. Got a little bit more inflation into that. And now, so looks like we're going to get a little more twisting. We're actually going to do the optics. Okay. Gonna do, are you going to twist the ridges or leave them straight? I'll we'll twist the ridges. Okay. So now Josh has created the lines. Very similar to the piece that Todd made earlier, where Todd made basically like horizontal lines out of the frit, and then he used a tool to rake it from one end to the other, and he did that from both directions. Josh is going to take these lines. He's going to blow into the optic mold, and you'll see what comes out and as this progresses. So take a good look when he raises it up. And there are interruptions within the lines there. Okay, so you're going to take a quick reheat after being in that metal canister. Now, Bruce, we're going to pretend that you're one of the people that has the 
Oh, okay. So you're going to have a hand in making it. I'm going to have a hand. While you film it. You didn't say, but how? I don't well, you I, 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 Yeah, beautiful powder. Alright Bruce, so what kind of shape would you like to make for your Unity box? I would like a, uh, a vase that's wider at the top, okay. tapered gently down through the middle, okay. and uh, have the, the lip rolled outward uh, and a, a bit of a constricted neck. Or, or should, should I should I defer to my better half? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not allowed to make decisions. Let's see if you can sit in the bench. Sit <laughs> at the <laughs> bench. <laughs> you want me to do the camera too? Do the camera I'm going to do the camera. Right. Okay. Let's see if you can do that. Okay. So now what? Generally, we would have our people. You're gonna lightly squeeze just on the neck. There we go. Just light pressure. A little bit harder. There you go. Good. That's a pretty good angle with the camera. Yeah, it's really, <laughs> it's really weird to try to look through the camera and use the jacks, but yeah, sure. But that's generally what we would have people do for the process if they wanted to. Exactly. So what you couldn't see at the time was Josh was turning the iron the whole time and guided my hand over with the jack. Yeah, so I would, you know, generally have the people come over and then stun to start to squeeze. There you go, squeeze a little harder. Very nice. Good. <laughs> that is really strange. <laughs> it's also uh, kind of interesting for our guests because we are so used to turning the iron and using the jacks, we know how to equalize the pressure. And so while Josh is turning, and I have one hand on the jacks and the other on the camera, I don't I don't get the sense right. of the rotation. Really interesting. But it's a great idea. We've we've done this sort of thing for years with folks. Alright, so are so we done with that process, part? We'd actually have the people swing it if they would like to. Okay. So now what I usually tell people is before it gets too hot. What you're going to do is, you're going to hold it straight down and swing it back and forth like a pendulum. Okay. So you get the height that you want. I want to see this. <laughs> yeah, we're going to try it. No stunt is too crazy for the art of fire. Okay, I got the uh, box in the background over there. Josh is going to hang the iron straight down, put it into my hand, and we're going to see if we can swing and lengthen this. But we're not going to do a 360 degree turn overhead with just one hand. That ain't happening. No, we usually don't get people to do that. Into my hand. Okay. Like this? Yeah, there we go. Not bad. All right, that was fun. You can see it's got the height. Now Bruce said he wanted it a little bit longer. Yep. So we're going to what? 
Hang it again? Yep, let's hang it again. Repeat that process. Okay. I got it. There we go. Is that about the height? Yeah, that's, that's fine. High. That's great. All right, good. All right. Oh, look what we did, honey. <laughs> <laughs> so now All that right. we got our height, we usually have the people with a wood paddle. Okay. Flatten the bottom. So you well, grab the paddle from the bucket. And you're going to press with the paddle as we're rolling down the back. Oh boy! <laughs> Where else could you see something like this? <laughs> okay. Yep. So, Josh is going to turn. And we're getting a little bit of a ring foot. That's beautiful. All right, that was fun. Right, now we're ready for the transfer. Foster will present us a buddy. Okay. So while they're getting ready to do the transfer, since you all have, have seen this many, many times before, uh, a friend of ours who runs a studio in Stanton, Virginia, Doug Sheridan at Sunspot Studio, uh, has sponsored for years a Virginia Glass Blowers Festival. And uh, one of the highlights for us was always engaging in a glass blowers competition in the evening. This was when the, the public had left. And uh, one really interesting comp contest was when we had to make a piece completely with our non-dominant hand. So we didn't have anybody ambidextrous at that particular uh, event. So the rest of us, if we were right-handed, we had to work left-handed the whole time. And lefties had to work with the right hand. So, uh, all right, now what, now what do right, I do? Bruce. So let me give you an example. So you're going to use your jacks. You're going to reach in the mouth. Okay. And you're going to be about this angle, and you're going to be pressing down to the ground. Okay. To open the mouth. Now, as you get it open, you're going to also start to lower your hand to change the angle. Oh wow. So holding the jacks like that when you're outside. Hold the, back. the jacks like this. Okay. This sounds complicated. <laughs> Anyway, it was a real adventure to make pieces with the opposite hand. And then uh, one time we had a contest where we had to wear an eye patch. And uh, I actually made a piece with Josh's assistance. And there's actually film evidence of being completely blindfolded and making a cup. Okay, so now what? So now we'll reach in. Uh-huh. You're going to be pressing down to the ground lightly. Okay. And then you start to lower your hand so it changes the angle. Good, then you take your jacks away and we go over top like this. Like this? Yeah, and you're going to squeeze down just like we were doing a jack line. Okay. Here, let's do hey, that that's one more fun. Time. So anyway, I'm here to tell you that uh, blindfolded glass blowing with your partner telling you how far you are away from the glory hole and that you have to move left or right is a real adventure. What are we going to do now, Mr. Reese? We're going to continue to squeeze down that neck using the last motion we were just using. So straight down, squeeze lightly. Now you're going to start to lean out your hand towards the furnace, real light. Alright. So 
So you'll also notice that he did guide my hand. You know, I'm playing the part of the student. So uh, at any rate, ooh, next tool. We're gonna blow it up. We're gonna use the steam stick, and you're gonna press pretty firmly. All right. And keep the pressure sealed. Okay. And this is gonna inflate the shoulder. We've been waiting for this. <laughs> I'm gonna get a little extra water on it. No, you don't need extra water. Okay. Same thing, I'll guide them in and you press pretty firm. Oh yeah. Good. Cool. And you can grab your jacks again. Straight up and down like we did our last motion and lean out the angle. There you go. Alrighty. There's your boss, Mr. Ferguson. Oh boy, I love it. <laughs> flash heat and it'll take it off and we were having some fun with that but uh, we work with folks all the time we have a lot of different ways always keeping you safe keeping your hands out of harm's way guiding you through all the steps and never having a student do anything that we're uncomfortable with them doing or that we feel they are uncomfortable with so uh, Comfort and safety are what it's all about. Yeah, and then if it's getting warm, we'll have them wear gloves or sleeves, just like Bruce was saying, so they feel comfortable and everything's safe. Absolutely. All righty, great. Well, let's hear it for Bruce and Josh. Yeah, yeah <laughs> The happy couple. Congratulations. No, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. congratulations. <laughs> okay, so uh, quick review. You've seen... Uh, all of uh, the drinkware, toasting to the happy couple. Actually, I guess the happy couple in this case was uh, Foster and Josh, but uh, we're all happy here. Okay, so thank